Um, I want to um, introduce the event. This is a conversation around television, film, and dating norms. Um, and this is part of our Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month programming. Um, we are joined today by Dr. Lisa Hubner from Westchester University. Uh, Dr. Hubner is a professor in the Department of Women's and Gender Studies at Westchester University of Pennsylvania. And for over 20 years, she has studied, applied, taught, and published in the areas of intersectionality theory and sociology of gender. And her publications include the book, Catheters, Slurs, and Pickup Lines, Professional Intimacy in Hospital Nursing. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Hubner. It, it is a pleasure to be here, Amelia. Please call me Lisa going forward. <laughs> I will do that. <laughs> and thank you for the introduction. I'm so happy to be doing this with you. You know how I feel about the Domestic Violence Center of Chester County. So this is an honor. Yeah, we appreciate your continued support and we appreciate you joining us today. Um, I think we're going to learn so much from you throughout this conversation, so I'm really excited to get going. Um, today we are going to chat a little bit about television and film um, and the representations of love and dating that we see in television and films and specifically really how those representations influ influence our dating norms um, and what unhealthy expectations films and television are setting um, for us as a society. Um, so what was cool is in preparation for this event, um, we launched a TikTok uh, account as an agency. And for the lead up to that, what we decided to do was share different examples of what we saw as red flag behaviors in television and film depictions of love and romance. And we had a lot of action on these posts on our TikTok. And so um, one of the things that came up, um, you know, in the back and forth that, that commenters had was uh, this idea of it's just a movie, it's just a TV show, and aren't we able to differentiate, you know, the two and, and you know, it's can't we just tell and, and only, you know, someone who doesn't understand clearly would watch a movie and take it literally. Um, and I think that there is um, an important, you know, why when we talk about the issue of representations of love and romance and the influence on our dating norms. So I'd really like to toss this to you, um, Lisa, to explain the factors of um, what goes into play when we're talking about why it's not just a movie and it's not just a TV show. Sure. Um, I, you know, you and I had a great conversation about this too. So please jump in as, as we talk. I really am excited that this will be more of a conversation between the two of us, one of many that we've had over the years. And other people should jump in too with their thoughts and ideas. I mean, yes, I'm a sociologist, but we all live in this social world, right? And one of the things that we do in sociology is we study our lived experiences and we find common patterns. So it would be one thing if we lived in a vacuum. And, you know, maybe in that vacuum, we watched that one television show that had that one harmful representation. Yes, then, of course, it would be very easy to say, what's the harm? You know, for example, what is the harm in going on one roller coaster, right? It would be one thing if it was just in a vacuum, but that's not how we live in our social world. You know, we don't live in these separate boxes. These boxes overlap and these boxes um, inform each other. And so by boxes, I'm talking about how we learn how to be through media is one box, but also, you know, we are learning how to be through our families and we are learning how to be through our faith-based communities and we are learning how to be through our school systems and really any kind of social interaction that we have. So it's not just the show, right? The show, what it is, is that the show or the film is reinforcing the same ideas that are reinforced in all of these other quote unquote boxes, right? Other social realms. And that's how socialization occurs. We're learning not just how to interact with each other, but we are learning, you know, what and, and we're learning ideas and then we're learning how to place meaning on those ideas. So yeah, we learn, you know, how, what it means. We learn that there are men and women 
and non-binary people. And then we learn what that means to all of us in society. So that's socialization. Does that make sense? Yes, absolutely. Good. Um, and, and I think that it's important also to note that, you know, as you said, the media really does inform our behaviors um, and, and our social understanding of our role essentially in society. Um, and I think that that's something that will continue to come up, especially when we talk about gender identity um, and gender roles um, in terms of these relationship depictions in media and as well as these behaviors that we're gonna be talking about, these common unhealthy behaviors that we see often popping up in our media portrayals of love and romance. Right, um, and we normalize as, as appropriate. I think that's the key, right? So socially we're normalizing these behaviors just because they're so pervasive, right? And, and, and if we question, then we tend to question ourselves which we shouldn't do, right? Exactly, and, yeah. and we do internalize the things that we see in media, and if we differ from them, then we might see ourselves as different from the norm. And especially, and we're talking about Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month, teens, really, we don't want to deviate from the norm. We wanna be, we wanna fit in. And so um, if we see something in, in the media, we might feel even more pressured to live up to these expectations and these um, norms. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that what we did in preparation for today's event was we really broke down the different tropes that we see in film and television depictions of relationships. Um, and we're gonna kind of break them all down a bit and talk about um, what each behavior is that we've seen that are unhealthy or problematic, right? Red flag behaviors in relationships. Um, in the media. And then we're going to maybe offer some examples. And throughout this, we really ask you all who are participating today, whether it be through Zoom or Facebook, to comment, to add input and examples and ask questions throughout because we want this to be a very interactive learning experience with you all as well. But we will provide a few examples. You may provide some examples as well. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about why these unhealthy depictions are so commonly and frequently seen in depictions of media. Why do we see them as romantic, um, as ideal, rather than the red flag that they are? Um, and then what do these relationships look like when they play out in real life? What do these behaviors look like in real life and not in this perfect universe that is Hollywood? Um, and so, Let's jump right in. Um, one of the first red flags that I wanna talk about and address that we see very frequently is um, not taking no for an answer. Um, and this is often in the initial courting um, period in a relationship when we see it in television and film. It's almost um, some examples can be done in a way that looks like stalking, but is really cute, right? So. Um, for example, if the one of the romantic leads sets up a series of events to, oh, just happen to bump into the other romantic lead. They, they researched where that individual was gonna be and then showed up there and then pretended, oh, I was just in the neighborhood kind of a thing. Um, one example where we've seen this occur is on the television show, How I Met Your Mother. Um, where Ted Mosby kind of sets up and runs literally across the city to another area where he sees um, Robin, who he is interested in, um, and runs into her and pretends, oh, I was actually just shopping here. And she says, oh, that's weird. You, your neighborhood is on the other side of the city. Um, and so it's that idea of stalking or you know, leading up to this meet cute in a way that is created and fabricated by a romantic lead, but then also the not taking no for an answer, right? A romantic lead often we'll see um, takes another lead's in disinterest in them as a challenge to be overcome. And they continue to try and, and get that date and get that um, romantic interest back, um, even though it's clearly not there yet. Um, and a perfect example of this that actually got a lot of attention and people were upset a little bit about it on our TikTok um, is in The Notebook. 
um, where Ryan Gosling's lead goes up to uh, the, the lead, uh, you know, the opposite romantic lead in that movie, Allie is the character's name, and asks her on a date. She says no. And in the TikTok, we count that she says no five or six times um, in different ways. And so he climbs the Ferris wheel, hangs by one hand and says, I'll let go unless you go on a date with me. And it's this viewed as this romantic gesture and look at the lengths that he would go to for this date. Um, <laughs> but in reality, we're really not hearing the consistent answer of no there. Um, so let's dive right in. Let's talk about why do we like this? Why, when we see this, do we think that this is romantic? So, you know, I, I think that's the question, right? I think when we're thinking about this, we need to, you keep saying romantic lead, and I keep thinking, let us consider the gender identity of those romantic leads. You know, so if it's the masculine or the male person doing this, the question then is, why are we more excited? What happens when the script is flipped? When it's the more feminine or the woman who's doing it? Do we, are we just as excited or are we saying something else about that romantic lead based on gender ideologies that we see elsewhere? Right, she's so, desperate, she's creepy. Crazy, yeah. creepy, weird, over the top little too aggressive, right? We don't say that about the male romantic leads. Instead, we're saying like, oh my gosh, look at that investment. <laughs> look at that interest, exactly. right? And in the so, same vein as that, it's um, even thinking like appearances. This came up in one of the commenters. They said, let's pretend it's not Ryan Gosling. Let's pretend it's, and no offense, Steve Buscemi. And do we feel the same way about this behavior or suddenly is it a little more alarming and creepy to us, right? So when it's a really attractive looking male lead in that, it helps as well. Right, and so normative attractive looking, right? Like what we norm as attractive, regardless of what individual people find attractive. You know, this whole like standard of attractive masculinity is something that is also socialized and normed. Um, I think one of the reasons that we get excited or we might have, you know, whether we envision ourselves as the person receiving that attention, we envision ourselves as the person giving that attention as the male romantic lead. I think one of the reasons we might get excited, and I'd be curious to hear what you think and what other folks think as well, is because we don't expect that from masculinity. We don't expect, nor do we socialize men and boys to really be that invested in romance. But what do we do for women and girls? We socialize us to be excited. You know, how often do we hear, especially on these reality shows, women saying, oh, I've been planning my wedding since I was a little girl. Do we, do we hear the guys say that ever, right? So I wonder, you know, to me that, that, that the reason we react that way, perhaps, I mean, I'm not a psychologist, but the reason we might be reacting that way is tied to how we socialize uh, love and romance on a gendered level. I think that's a really um, key point. And, and you even think about it, we're talking about growing up as, as, you know, a young girl sitting there planning her wedding. And she's also sitting there watching princess movies. And what right. happens with the romantic male lead in a princess movie? He's chasing, he's pursuing, he's following. So it's been established from like, even our initial experiences with um, television, film, and romance are these stories of, you know, Prince Charming pursuing the princess. Um, and, and I think that that's something, too, that, that came up in conversation was the idea of, and I think it's this gendered piece of, it, it's, it's a game that the, that the woman plays when she says no, and she really means yes. And, and I think that that has been, um, that's a very unhealthy norm because I'll tell you when I say no, I mean no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but in a lot of uh, situations, it even sets up expectations for young men that in the real world and, and shifting into what does this behavior look like in real life, it looks like violating consent. It looks like crossing boundaries. It looks like showing up places and maybe 
you know, freaking that person out a little bit and making them feel a little overwhelmed and as though their boundaries are being crossed. Um, and so I think that that's an important thing um, to bring up is that we are both um, as young um, as young people, regardless of our gender identity, we are socialized to expect to be pursued and to want to play this cat and mouse back and forth game. But when it actually plays out, it doesn't look like it does in the movies and it doesn't feel like it does in the movies. And that can maybe be a bit confusing and um, disorienting. Right, right, absolutely, absolutely. Let's move on to the next um, section. I think this is a very natural progression as well. Um, the second norm or trope that we see in um, romantic depictions of relationships in the media is manipulation and deception. So manipulating a situation to go my way romantically or um, saying these little, what I believe are harmless lies to get what I need or want out of a relationship. Um, and so with manipulation and deception, it can be things, um, you know, in one way where if there's an issue in the relationship, I'm going to do whatever I can to cover my tracks and fix it and fix it and fix it to, um, you know, make sure that my partner doesn't find out about whatever this, you know, mishap is, especially when we talk about like rom-coms and um, sitcoms when they have these romantic situations. We always see an individual trying to cover up the, the mishaps that have occurred um, or even just deception and manipulation in when we talked about like facilitating that meet cute when we first meet and, and we do so in a manipulative way and in, in a way that deceives an individual. Um, and so uh, this is an interesting one because I think it flips the, the gender roles on, on its head. Um, but when I think about this, and the first thing I think of when I think of deception is um, while you were sleeping, which is a rom-com with Sandra Bullock, in which she meets a man as he's in an accident, and she accompanies him to the hospital, just being a helpful <laughs> bystander to this situation. But boy, is this, you know, stranger handsome. <laughs> and she becomes interested in him and he's fallen into a coma. And so she ends up in this series of mishaps in which his family believes that she is his fiance. Does she fix any of these mishaps or does she go along with the deception? Uh, she goes along with the deception and in it falls in love with his brother. <laughs> then in the end, this whole thing obviously falls apart and what it comes down to is we find out, you know, oh, you've been, you're a stranger. You don't know my brother at all. You've been faking this entire time that you're his fiance and you're not. But now we are interested in each other and it's a romantic happy ending. And so I find that to be one of the most absurd kind of ideas of this. Um, I'd love to see if you know of any examples or if uh, anyone watching has any additional examples of you know, deception and manipulation specifically in terms of like setting up that meet cute and then trying to cover your tracks the whole time, right? Um, and I find that interesting. So I think it's um, when we talk about why we like this in media, my notes are that um, in a movie, it's funny. It's right. funny, it's quirky, it sets up the plot, it moves the plot along. But why else might we see these things and think of them in a romantic way? Right. I mean, I think also, too, we're sidebarring just a bit, but then we'll come back. I think because it does go to why do we like this stuff? I mean, even as you're telling that part of the plot, I've seen the movie myself. I'm laughing. I'm remembering it. Why do we enjoy it so much? Well, you know, it, this is an example of how these things are funny and and fantasy and, you know, why TV and film, why we watch it to get away from our own lives anyway. And, you know, one thing that you and I talked about is how we're not ever suggesting that there should be censorship or that we should avoid any of this, right? You know, it's just about making sure like we know that that's entertainment and that's not real life. Um, because we want we want that happy ending. We want that Disney ending, right? Where it's like everything works out in the end. But when you when you sit here and do what we're doing, which is to play out what that might look like in real life, I mean, can you imagine? You know, 
in the level of absurdity and the level right. of fear that I think I would have in that situation to find out you are a complete stranger and you fabricated right. this entire relationship. I mean, that would be terrifying. And how me, that's going to really. betray trust and, and everything else. And so I think the reason we are drawn to it and maybe think this is one path to romance. I mean, I know even just saying that sounds ridiculous, but we don't think about this consciously, right? It's just sort of in the back of our minds where, oh, wouldn't it be great if, because it's easy, it doesn't require work. It doesn't require us to messy. Yeah. You know, it's just sort of like everything falls into place. And so then what it does is it feeds this lie about romance, which is that it should be natural and easy and everything should fall into place and we shouldn't have to learn how to communicate with each other because and we can overlook even the biggest things right. like this because of because love. of matters of the heart yeah. right exactly because of love <laughs> love wins love wins Amelia. and that's my final note and everything is this overarching theme of love conquers all love right. can overcome the lies and deception and manipulation even to that level. Um, but, so but I, in terms, I think that's Yeah, really and I think when we do break it down and we think about, you know, that this, this is another way that um, this relates to the one we just talked about because we are normalizing what is actually deception as interest and investment, right? You know, so that's what's happening in that movie. And look at all the effort that goes into creating that, that meet cute, but then also into keeping up that story, that lie, right? So it must really be meant to be that. They must really love me if they're going to all that work. Exactly. Exactly. And when in real life, we had talked about it's scary, it's strange, it's off-putting, but also in real life, lies hurt. Mm -hmm. Betrayal hurts. Mm -hmm. And I think that one thing almost everyone who has felt betrayal in our audience today can agree upon is that once trust is broken, it is so difficult to get it back and to stay in what would be a happy, healthy relationship without that. Once you've broken that trust, there is a, it's going to take a lot to rebuild it. And so we don't get to see what happens after happily ever after in these cases and in these films and television shows where there's been such a significant betrayal of trust. And this actually, I think, segues perfectly into the next uh, trope or topic, um, which is a form of deception um, and is a a form of of betrayal, which is cheating. Um, Cheating is very normalized in television and film, whether it be there's cheating within a relationship and they make it work out um, in the end, or in the sense that um, cheating is how the relationship begins. That's the meet cute is they're both in other relationships. Um, And so an example of that, that you and I had talked about was the wedding planner with Matthew McConaughey and JLo, right? Um, And they are both in other relationships. She's Mm -hmm. dating, um, and, and he's engaged and she is their wedding planner for mm-hmm. their wedding. And, and there's this meet cute of, you know, he rescues her and whatnot, but in the end, what we see in films, and, and this happens often in films is that, um, you know, his partner's a little selfish and she's a little more focused on the wedding and less focused on the relationship. And aren't these acceptable reasons for her to face the punishment of being cheated on and being left for another person, right? Um, right. And, and we always see these individuals that are cheated on for those romantic leads to end up together. We see them portrayed in a certain light that because these people are a certain way, you know, whether it's focused on business or focused on themselves or, you know, what have you, sometimes even featured in a way that's unintelligent or what have you, um, they, they deserve what happens to them. They're set up in a way that we don't feel as bad for them as we would in real life. Um, so I found that very interesting as well. Um, and again, it's, it's shown as a way that it's forgivable 
And then because of certain reasons, you know, true love and all of those flaws of the last partner, it's excusable. Right. Right. And what that also then does is it helps to make a case to blame the individual, right? Rather than to blame the person who's doing the cheating, we're going to blame the person who's being cheated on. And we can think about how that blaming connects then to um, other ways we blame people who have been harmed or cheated on or what have you. I'm also noticing, I don't know if you can see the comments and that there's like comments in the chat too. And some good comments and I think there's a question, but, um, but yeah, I think that uh, that's when we were talking about it before, like that, that's one of the biggest concerns is that we put the responsibility of the cheating on the one that's being cheated on. Exactly. And I, it, it's not fair. And I think it's interesting how, you know, <laughs> I personally, as someone who has experienced that, who has been cheated on, um, I don't watch those films and television shows and feel romantic about them. Right. But I think prior to that, maybe I did, you know, back when I was younger and I first saw The Wedding Planner and I thought, oh, this is such a cute movie. And I really hope she ends up with Matthew McConaughey in the end. Why? Why was I thinking that? I have no <laughs> idea. I can't answer that. Um, and, and what do you think? Lisa, what do you think the socialization factor would be? Or what, what do we, what are we looking at with that and thinking this is a romantic way for this to go down? I mean, I think it's the same. I think it's how it's framed, right? I'm, Cause I'm trying to think, I have two questions that come to mind. That question, why, it, you know, what's the socialization that goes into that? But also are the depictions gendered, right? So when it's the woman cheating, how is she portrayed compared to when the man is cheating? Do you feel like there's a pattern? Exactly, exactly. I feel like there probably is. I mean, I haven't done an empirical study on that, but I feel like there probably is. Um, and then that how that draws on other sort of like gender ideologies. You know, I we do expect um, men and people who are masculine to be not as committed like we sort of socialize this idea that they're not committed that we they're not going to be lower monogamous. expectations than we hold yeah uh, which doesn't to. doesn't say good things about men and boys and I have a I mean many you know you know I have a son you know I'm not yeah. trying to raise my child to have low expectations about himself or Absolutely. you know I, his I peers and so that yeah. uh, we have a comment here in our um, zoom chat that says that, and this is, I think, really ties into what we're talking about right now is um, when we talked about manipulation and deception um, and this uh, comment says, I find that the adjective manipulative is almost always attributed to women's behavior. It is. And yes. um, how do we also hold men accountable for highly manipulative and deceptive tactics? Um, and how do we hold them accountable, especially when we're seeing these manipulative and deceptive tactics romanticized when a man engages in them through uh, media. That's a great, that's a great comment. That's because what that does is it makes clear what I've been trying to say, which is how the characteristics of femininity in women are then tossed onto how we describe and represent love and romance. And it's true, socially, that is a word that gets attached to women. And there have been empirical studies on that, right? Like much more so th than men. And it gets back to then us thinking about their, that men are doing this behavior, but we're calling it something else. So you and I had talked about before, like when do we call what's actually manipulation or deception protection, right? When we're saying like the lead is maybe protecting, you know, the other romantic lead from some kind of something, but really there's and lying. Yeah, yeah, there's lying going on, but yeah. Exactly. Which goes into, you know, sort of dominant ideas of femininity, especially white femininity of fragility, right? You know, oh, she can't handle the truth. So I think these gendered notions are absolutely being circulated and reinforced onto yeah. the platform of love. Can we and, call it that? The platform of love? Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I love that. Um, <laughs> oh. <laughs> so I think that that's really huge. And I think that that's something that we can really kind of look at when we talk about all of the examples that we might think of um, 
especially, you know, in what I'm looking back at as, you know, late 90s, early 2000s examples of, of love and romance. And, you know, I might be dating myself with those. Um, and if anybody has more recent examples of these types of things, and, and if there is a shift, since we are seeing a slow and steady shift in representation of different relationships in media, um, whether that be um, you know, through gender identity and sexualities and things like that. Um, but are we still seeing these gender norms placed on these characters and are they still made to act within the social confines of their gender identity when they are represented in, in film and media? So I think that that's a, a larger um, exploration and that's something though that we can really focus on with all of these tropes and norms. Um, mm -hmm. So I think the next one that really, I. Think it speaks especially to the work that we do here at the Domestic Violence Center of Chester County um, is this idea that screaming matches are sexy, that, that fighting and arguing and screaming in one another's face is showing passion rather than um, something that is unhealthy or abusive. And, and the reason that I bring this up is um, because you see it all the time in film and television and it ends with a makeout session. It ends with a, with a very sexy scene. It's a build up, a passionate, intense build up to this kiss, this moment, this I'm mm. gonna, or I'm even gonna cut this person off from talking and finishing their thought with a kiss kind of passion. Right. Um, and I think that this, you know, understandably it's, it's comes down to this question of how do we differentiate passion from abuse um, and, and, and intensity from abuse. Um, but, but why do we see that screaming behavior and think of it in, in a romanticized way? Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 oh. I'm not sure we, we do see it and it's very pervasive and I'm not sure what's so um, attractive about that other than when you're viewing your, you know, you're kind of living through that, like you, your, your adren adrenaline might also be pumping, right. It might even be a physiological response, but yeah, it's, it's such a perfect example of something that looks interesting and compelling on the screen, <laughs> but is so can be so frightening in person and if not frightening if it's not abuse if it's actually fighting right because one of the things that you all do such a good job of is making that distinction between fighting and abuse right yeah. so if it's not abuse and if it's just a a, a fight that's still painful so it, it, exactly why? yeah i and i think it's an important thing that you brought up that's so true is that in healthy relationships we have disagreements, we get into arguments and there will be back and forth and we are gonna get angry and you know maybe raise our voice. Um, but in those situations, it's important to differentiate first off, what is healthy arguing and healthy fighting in our relationship um, and what is abuse? So I always say, ask two questions. Am I arguing to win? And am I arguing to hurt? the other person. Right. Um, right. Because if I'm arguing to win, this isn't a healthy argument. I want the power and control over the outcome of this situation. And then if I'm arguing to hurt, it's very clearly a me versus you kind of a thing rather than you and me versus the problem, which right. is how most arguments should be, right? We right. should really be um, frustratedly <laughs> figuring out where that breakdown in communication happened and how we can resolve it moving forward rather than just fighting. And that's the thing too, is that when we see this in media depictions, there's never a resolution. We never get the, so here's where that hap that breakdown <laughs> happened. Here's what I actually meant when I said this, they never finish it. And it, and it becomes almost like we equate screaming and fighting to sex. It, right. It becomes and the, and the sex is the right moment. The sex is the resolution. Yeah, some I think it was Andrea in the chat posted. Um, thank you, Andrea, for that. Said that you know if I yell loud enough, I, it shows I care. And I, I think that's a perfect way of putting it. Again, we're defining investment in love and romance in this 
case via screaming, right? Mm -hmm. via, via like yelling if I jump, jump up and down enough or if I like whatever. And I, you know, we haven't talked about this yet, but I keep thinking about how when we were first talking, it's, it might be helpful if we analyze love and romance, if we take a lesson from the way that many of us now in the mainstream and in scholarly circles have analyzed the beauty myth, right? You know, something, beauty standards that have been so normalized, you know, and we know they're not true, but we still like pressure ourselves because as a society, we're really messing up what we mean by beauty. You know, we're photoshopping and we're doing all of this other thing. So with romance and love, we're really photoshopping, you know, that to a point where we have no actual definition. It's so I feel like that's partly what's happening. You know, we're defining investment, as Andrea said, you know, by yelling enough and loud, loud enough. And I think that's such a huge thing to tie together is how, you know, we talk about all the time that television, film, media really influences our beauty standards. And we see that it influences beauty culture. We've seen the significant shift in beauty culture and how many influencers are involved in beauty and, and how almost all influencers look the same because mm -hmm. of this ideal of beauty that, that we've been kind of seeing marketed through media portrayals. And as you said, we're almost as just like they are curating their image as influencers, we're curating an ideal image of relationships. And even speaking in influencer terms, we see a ton of social media influencers who are couples. Right. And they are also playing into these tropes, this hashtag right. relationship goals right. ideal. Um, right. And so I find that so interesting is that these individuals who are setting up then through social media, YouTube channels and TikTok and what have you, these re curated relationships, they're getting influenced by the television, the film and the media as well. Right. And then they're selling this curated ideal that has been sold to them. So I think right. that it, it's really like a multi-layer approach. It's really interesting when we talk about it in that sense. Yeah. Um, absolutely. Uh, we have a really cool comment on our Facebook as well from Ann Kirk um, that it also feeds into anticipation of needs. Why do I need to tell you how I feel? You should just be able to know. Right. That's and a I, big one. Again, it's that one. naturalizing, making it magical, making it not clunky. You know, that's just something that's supposed to be. I love how you said not clunky because that comes up also even in conversations of consent with teens is how awkward is it to ask to kiss someone? How awkward is it to ask, can I have sex with you, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Do you want to have sex? Like these mm -hmm. conversations that we have to have to have healthy communication and relationships. We have to have these clunky, awkward conversations. That's what real real life healthy relationships look and feel like clunky and awkward hollywood doesn't want it to look like that and so yeah in hollywood i should be able to anticipate your needs and and if that doesn't happen then it ends up in a big fight and then a makeout sesh and a steamy scene you know um but in in the real world it's a clunky argument that's uncomfortable and awkward and maybe there's some arguing and some yelling and some tears and and in the end maybe not the sex <laughs> you know <laughs> Oh, not, not right now, you know, yeah, right. so it's really interesting how that's not such a sexy marketable take on love and romance, but that's really what it looks and feels like. And, and what this image is selling is, is packaging these unhealthy things as romantic, right. as ideal. And so right. I think that's really interesting, this curating of relationships, mm -hmm. um, you know, beauty standards, dating standards. Mm -hmm. um, and then this is a perfect way to get into it because we we're literally just talking about clunky conversations. The normalization in media of avoiding having conversations at all about relationships. Um, and I think that that's a huge one too when you're talking about covering up the mishaps instead of mm -hmm. just having a very forward conversation with my partner about how I'm feeling, what happened, and what we need to do moving forward what's happening here is we're just avoiding it all together and doing everything we can, whether that be like deception and manipulation leading up to 
avoiding that conversation. Why right. is avoiding these, these conversations? Why is that something ideal other than, as we just talked about, seeing awkward conversations <laughs> and uncomfortable moments in relationships isn't really entertaining. And we might be left as an audience feeling, you know, squirmy and awkward. Right. I, again, this, this does not translate well into real life, right? You know, maybe it's okay on the screen. Um, it doesn't fit like the narrative and that's fine, but in real life, it doesn't, you know, you always talk about how it doesn't really solve the issue. My thinking, the, I think something I can offer here is just how, again, that's so gendered, right? In other realms, we, you know, women and girls are not naturally better at communicating than boys and men. Like it's, they're really, I'm not a biologist. So for the biologists out there, you know, you can, you can, we can debate about this, but as far as I know, there really is nothing on the second X chromosome that suggests that somehow we're, we're better at putting a few words together or we're better at feeling emotions or talking about our emotions. Instead, what happens in so many different realms, we socialize um, girls and, and, and women to, to do it. And you're better at it only because you have practiced at it. You and know? we've been told we're better at it. We've been, right. you know. So we have value in that, yeah. So I think that's part of it. I, again, I, I would be curious to hear some actual examples. I mean, sometimes I, you know, you say you're in a certain generation, I live under a rock. So I feel like what I would want to know is, is it gender? You know, this, like, who's doing the avoiding? Who's and, doing the wanting to talk and who's doing the avoiding? And I would agree with that. Um, for example, and this one uh, stirred things up as well, but I, I talked about Ross and Rachel from Friends. <laughs> and we, for years on Friends, got the consistent stonewalling of Ross with, we were on a break. And so from day one, Rachel needed to have a conversation with Ross about what occurred in their relationship, which was, he felt insecure about a colleague of hers. Mm -hmm. He overcompensated by becoming a little too, you know, too much, <laughs> mm -hmm. crossing boundaries, showing up at work, things like that. And she said, I need some space. I need a break. There was no defining role or rules for the break. It was just, I need a break from us. Um, and that very night, Ross goes out and <laughs> sleeps with someone else and then runs around the city the next day after finding out that Rachel has had her break in her space and is ready to now have a conversation about what occurred and, and share how she felt and why she felt her boundaries are violated and what she need from Ross moving forward. Instead, he spent the day running around to make sure she didn't find out that he had slept with someone. So there's that running around deception, um, right. deception and manipulation of everything. And then what happens is when they do go to have the conversation, he continues to justify and blame the break and, mm. and her um, inability to define the, the confines within which they will act during that break and how long the break will be. And that's why, and so it's excuse, the cheating again is excusable for Ross and, and Rachel doesn't feel that way. And we see many seasons of the show follow that event in which she does try again to have that necessary communication and conversation about it in which he shuts it down. We were on a break. And that's, that's the end of it. Cause that's, he stonewalls it. It's done. That's the answer. And rather right. than her ever being able to share her feelings and be validated in those. Right. Um, and right. so I think that that's a huge one is avoiding talking about it. And just, this is it my way or the highway, my perception of the situation. So that's an example of it that I might you know, think of, and I think we could think of that in a lot of um, sitcoms, especially The Office is another example, Jim and Pam. Um, for years, this will they, won't they, will they, won't they, they both have feelings for each other and they're avoiding talking about them with each other. Right, right, right. It adds to the mystery and we've defined mystery as an important component 
in love and romance when it doesn't always really play out well in real life, right? But certainly when you look at representation, that's that that kind of not talking adds to the mystery. And then in the case of the Ross and Rachel example and other examples like that, it's also a control issue. You know, if I'm I'm using this sentence <laughs> as a roadblock, that's also stopping Rachel from her voice, right? You know, so he is not just avoiding it. He's he's constructing what will or what won't be the narrative around it. And I think that's important too, you know, it, it, that's it purposeful. And that's yeah. something that we do see in abusive relationships. Yeah. Like that directly translates into abusive relationships. That's something that, you know, we as educators on this team here at DVCCC, we are constantly bringing that up in our presentations, this idea of invalidating your feelings and your reality and reframing it in the way that I see it. And I want you to see it. I don't want you to see it that right. way. I want you to see it my way. So I'm just going to constantly be reframing it until you do see it my way. Um, right. Rather than sitting down and understanding that in healthy relationships, we have two different perceptions of it. And if I just right. understand yours and you understand mine, we can move forward to a healthier place. Um, but again, it, it, that involves those clunky, awkward conversations we're not going to see on television, right? <laughs> right Even right. in a show as awkward as The Office. <laughs> right. <laughs> Meant to right. be. Right. Um, the final one that I'd love to talk about, and I think is so important to talk about specifically in speaking to teens during Teen Dating Violence Awareness Month, is that when we talk about teens um, and, and representation of teen dating and teen relationships in the media. And this is where I'm going to date myself again. I think of shows like One Tree Hill and Gossip Girl and The OC. Um, but there are newer um, ideas of this, like Riverdale, right? Um, and right. All American is one that, um, you know, uh, I've seen you know, my stepson really enjoys watching. Um, and so it's, it's, it's interesting to see that one thing I see consistently occur in these teen dating shows is first off the normalization of teen adult relationships. Yeah. So a single adult, whether they be a teacher in a strange power role or dynamic, a friend's parent, um, or just another adult in that cast of characters gets involved with a teen when we know in reality what does that look like on screen i don't know scandalous so it's mm -hmm. interesting to watch but in reality that's illegal and wrong right um but then it also it opens up this larger conversation when we talk about teen relationships in the media and just the over sexualization of teens and teen relationships it sets up an expectation for teens that there should and always is sex involved right. in the relationship and that a lot of it centers around that um, and so i think that's an important thing to talk about and i know that you had some good talking points um, in regards to that because i think that that's an important thing that, that we need to have a conversation about specifically around consent. Yeah, I mean, I think I think this is, you know, when we earlier in the very beginning, we asked the question, like, what's the harm? Right? Well, there is there could actually be harm with this, you know, especially if preteens, tweens are watching this stuff and, you know, are figuring themselves out and getting this under and not having conversations about sexuality in any other way, like via school or via family. And so their only route really is this, then it seems like this is the way you do it. And the way you do it is that you have sex, you know, young as a way to show love again. Right. You know, and I combine that with that representation, especially if it's the dominant representation against how so many people are not interested in having actual um, comprehensive sex education for our youth, you know, in schools or wherever. And so it's, it just, it's, it's, it's a problem just waiting to happen. Um, yeah, I, I, and then as far as the normalization of teen and adult, I mean, again, as you said, this in real life, that's against the law. And clear say, power dynamic. Yeah. I think the show right now is called A Teacher. Yeah. And I believe that it's on Hulu. 
Mm -hmm. Um, and that's worth a watch just because it's one of the first depictions of this idea of a teen adult romance that's done in a way that feels as scary and icky as it is in real life. Um, as it actually is. Yeah. mm -hmm. Um, because, you know, even in shows like pretty little liars is an example of one in which I think that one of the, the young girls, who's one of the lead characters is on and off with a teacher throughout the series and that they end up together in the end. Um, and when we see that play out in real life, that's grooming. That's, right. That is not a, a young person who made those decisions autonomously. Right. Um, and I think that that's right. a really important thing to bring up is that this is not something, a teen adult relationship isn't something that we should be looking at and idealizing or romanticizing by any means. Um, or thinking like, oh, what a crazy, funny scandal that is. No, this is more of um, a very dangerous um, and, and scary thing. Yeah, I mean, and that's actually something I would want censored if I had to, if I had control and could pick the censoring. 100%. It, it would be that because I also think then what happens is it romanticizes the the attention that the adult gives the youth, you know, and you know, as a youth, you know, that's what grooming is, right? Like, you, you know, you're, you just feel like the person really likes being around you. And, you know, adolescents' brains are still developing. I mean, it's so, yeah, I, it's we hard see for it play out in this happy ending romantic way on television. So when it's playing out in real life and it feels icky, we are looking to that depiction of it and thinking, but no, it's romantic and, and what's wrong with me that I'm not seeing this being romantic. And then that manipulation right. and grooming that goes along with it saying, yeah, what is wrong with you that you're not seeing that this is romantic? Right. Because so much of that, when you're that age, you know, you want, you want to be taken seriously. You're not quite an adult, but you're feeling like an adult in some way. Why aren't you being treated more like an adult? Right. You know, specifically in that age range, and so then you have this adult telling you you're an adult, you know, treating so, you like an adult, the way that yeah. you are hoping an adult will look at you and treat you. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, and so that's, so I really feel like those representations are particularly harmful um, because they're almost like serving, they're, they're coming from the perspective of the perpetrator's viewpoint. Right. Like, and, and I think we need to start saying that out loud. You know, so much of media is critiqued from a gender perspective and saying like, oh, well, this is, you know, teaches girls to identify with men and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we have a lot of critiques around that, but we don't have necessarily specific critiques here, which is what about the representations that are making it seem like the perp's perspective is okay and normalized? We need to, I don't know. I just feel like I, I, I take a hard line. Yeah. It's huge and it's huge and it opens up again that larger conversation around consent and and grooming and those types of things. And when we look back at all of the the different tropes that we talked about, how every one of these tropes almost reinforces the idea of violating consent and the idea right. of uh, normalization of extremely unhealthy imbalances of power. Right. in relationships and accepting those as norm, the, the manipulation, the deception, not taking no for an answer, normalizing right. and romanticizing cheating, um, avoiding talking about these issues, and then ending with the over-sexualization of teens and normalization of teen adult relationships. It mm -hmm. all kind of leads up to that as, as you said, what's the harm? One of the most harmful aspects and how all of that reinforces it is it's scary. Um, and I'd love to hear if we want to close this, but I do want to have a conversation here because you and I are both reality TV enthusiasts um, and reality, <laughs> reality television. You just outed um, me. <laughs> Sorry. I should have asked. It's okay. I, I tell my students all the time. No, I tell my students all the time. I admit it as well. And <laughs> It's not a guilty pleasure. I don't feel guilty about it whatsoever. <laughs> I, I love reality television. And so when we talk about the depictions of dating and romance on reality TV, I think that it's so interesting um, how these television and film tropes that we've talked about also influence the tropes that we see in these reality shows about love and dating. So just some examples, um, things like 
you know, reality shows that are about young people and they're just regular dating lives. So we can think back to age myself again, like the Hills and Laguna beach, but then more, you know, more recent shows, um, Southern charm, uh, on Bravo and summer house, uh, Jersey shore, for example, you know, young people out and dating and what kind of, uh, and I think we could do a whole episode on Jersey Shore um, and the types of tropes that that, that show. Mm-hmm. And that's a problematic rewatch if anybody has the time. I, I did that uh, recently and was, whew. <laughs> um, but then other shows like Love Island and The Bachelor, which is one of uh, my absolute faves. Um, but I just love to touch briefly on how... Uh, you know, we can see some of these same tropes in reality TV romance. And, and maybe it, it plays out somewhere in between in these reality shows. It, it doesn't end up positive for these, for these individuals in the end. In a lot right. of cases, we don't get the happily ever after. We right. do get the after the final rose, right? We do get to <laughs> see kind of what plays out. And thanks to social media and these individuals being on there, we get to see how it plays out for these individuals. And it doesn't play out well. And it's often messy and awkward in the end. However, we still see these same tropes. And it's interesting. It's almost this in-between where they're trying really hard to show these romantic um, ideals that we've gathered from television and film, and yet they are just real people trying to do so. And so um, there's a lot of producer manipulation to try and make it look as good as possible, but it still does in the end kind of look a little awkward and clunky. Um, I'd love to hear you know, your thoughts on this, because we had talked briefly about relationships like Jersey Shore, Sam and Ron, and how unhealthy and unbelievably obviously so, you know, flipping furniture and, you know, making out with somebody at the bar in front of them just to make them angry and jealous. And these things that like watching it, you're like, oh, they're a train wreck. They are a mess. And yet that relationship continued to be something that we all wanted to watch, right? We, I can't look away. I do want to see. And even some people who are rooting for them to make it work, you know? Um, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think m- my immediate thought is to think about how the train wreck um, affirms the ideal, right? And that, and really what's the function of the train wreck? What's the function of the train wreck? What's the function of the one side? I mean, this is sort of, now I'm drawing on this kind of philosophical concept of the binary where you ha- always have two things and and they're framed in opposition. So the tra- the reality, show is really the exact opposite of the romantic ideal you know and it's why do we love the idea of falling apart <laughs> yeah i feel like we have these two extremes really is what's happening and they serve to support each other um in our viewing pleasure right like that's you know what i mean like why do we love it because it is a train wreck and we're like, oh, thank God, you know, my relationship isn't that at least, right? <laughs> like, or, you know what I mean? Or that happened and I'm away from that now. Or, or, oh my God, I'm in this. I need to get out of it or whatever, you know, it's so extreme and it's so dramatic, but it's quote unquote real. And so one thing I think that's important and a lot of, there's a lot of media criticism of some of the reality shows too that helps to do this is to just always realize that this is also a production you know, in the same way that our rom-coms are. And to really think about how the train wreck is supporting the ideal and the ideal of the rom-com is also then of course supporting the train wreck. And so we just have to like see it for what it is. Somebody early on asked, how can we watch this stuff without, you know, like hating ourselves? Well, you know, you and I both do it all the time. And I, and I think part of me is then also listening to other um, media that, picks it apart, you know, and analyzes it. It's still an escape, but just make sure that it's, you know, just that, right? And not something that is informing our actual relationships. But yeah, that's what I think about reality TV. I think the function is to be the train wreck, is to be the deviant. So then we're like better with ourselves. And we're somewhere in between where I might not be the ideal, but I'm not the worst. And so it almost further normalizes these unhealthy behaviors because at least it's not this bad. 
Right. right. And, and I think that that's such a great point to bring up. Uh, I, I really love that. Um, and I love what you said about being able to separate reality TV is not reality. TV and film is not reality. And we have right. to remind ourselves, this is a fantasy. This is not reality. This is not what it will ever look like <laughs> in real life. And to start being more critical of um, our consumption of media. And so, um, as we said before, this isn't about censorship, right? This isn't right. about saying we can't watch these things. And that was the thing that came up in so many comments about criticizing these different relationships is, oh, well, now you're going to cancel the notebook and you're going to cancel this and saying that we're canceling things. No, we're not canceling anything. I'm still going to watch the notebook and love it. I'm still mm -hmm. going to watch friends and root for Ross and Rachel in the end. That's okay. We can okay. consume, you know, media, but if we do so through a critical lens. And so um, right. Marissa actually asked a question here in the Zoom. How can we still watch our favorite television shows, our favorite movies that may have problematic aspects to them, but you know, simultaneously hold a place of nostalgia for us, right? I love this movie and yeah, I love this show. I love Jersey Shore, but it's super problematic. I love, <laughs> you know, I love The Notebook, but it's also, you know, not what normal, healthy, real life love looks like. Um, and so I think that that's huge. And we do have um, a number of reminders and things that we can do to ethically and more critically consume television and film and the media that we take in. <laughs> um, but I do want to just briefly share um, these reminders for our audience. Um, some of the things that we can think as we consume what would otherwise be a problematic uh, depiction of romance. So first, are there red flags popping up, right? So when we watch The Notebook and we see Noah Calhoun swinging from the, the Ferris wheel, we should say that's a red flag. And in real mm -hmm. life, how would that look and feel? Let's try and label what these red flags are. You know, is that avoidance? Is that control? Is that a power imbalance? What, is that a violation of a boundary or consent? Um, so try and label those red flags. Then when we look at the interactions that these couples have, ask very specific questions. First, are they able to compromise, right? Are they willing to compromise when they are working through uh, situations? Are they supported when they act outside of the confines of a traditional gender role? Um, so a perfect example of a relationship that does this very well um, is Ben Wyatt and Leslie Nope from Parks and Rec, um, who both take active leadership roles in their professional lives, as well as in their personal relationship. And when it's time for Ben to take the back seat so that Leslie can be a leader in her, her profession or in their family, he takes the back seat and plays support role and lets her be the leader. And then vice versa. She does the exact same for him. And so I think that that's a, a thing to ask is, you know, is this individual acting outside of what we would we talk about and we did talk about earlier these these gender roles and and how gender identity does play a significant uh part in in how we view healthy versus unhealthy relationships and and you know romance and media and roles in media um and so is this individual acting outside of the confines of what that typical role would be? And are they supported or is this something that's causing tension and conflict in the relationship? Um, are they willing and able to admit that they are wrong? Then do they offer a sincere apology without trying to justify or blame? And I wrote tying there, but I meant trying. Um, and I think this is a perfect one we talked about Ross and Rachel, mm -hmm. not able and willing to admit. That, that he was wrong, not able to offer a sincere apology because continuously we're justifying and blaming. We were on a break, right? What is the communication like with this couple? Is one person always doing the talking and are they actually listening to each other? And that's an important thing to, to remember just in relationships in general. Seek to, to understand where that person is coming from and seek to really listen. Don't listen to respond 
and to further make your point, but listen to really understand where your partner was coming from. Um, and then a really important one, because we were, we were talking a lot about uh, the sexualization of teen relationships. How is sex discussed? How is sex initiated in this relationship? Is one person the primary initiator and, and why and how, and how are they having these conversations? Are they, are they having conversations? Is the idea of consent presented in media? Um, Cause I think that's a huge thing to talk about and to understand. So these are just some of many questions that we can really ask ourselves to more critically and ethically consume uh, what could otherwise be unhealthy uh, depictions of romance and, and dating. Uh, so now, event. And again, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Hubner, for being with us. Um, and uh, it was so great. Thank you for having me. Yeah.